you were the first woman to run the Boston Marathon back in the 1960s. Is that right? I was the first woman to officially register and run the Boston Marathon. In 66, Roberta Gibbs jumped out of the bushes and ran the race. And in 67, I wanted to run and my coach insisted that I sign up for the race. And there were no rules, by the way, about it being a men's only race. Uh, we, we looked at all the rules, we checked the entry form, and I registered. And that's what made such a controversy because you know the story. The official attacked me in the race because I was a woman. Welcome to the Spartan Up podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. Catherine Switzer changed the world as the first registered female finisher of the Boston Marathon. She continues that mission with the 261 Fearless Foundation, named after her Boston bib number. And surprise, her run just may have indirectly inspired Joe DeSena to create Spartan. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Superbeats Heart Chews. Right now, you can get a free 30-day supply with your first purchase at superbeats.com slash spartan. All right, guys, Joe DeSena here, CEO and founder of Spartan and the Spartan Up podcast where I attempt, no, I do, rip people off the couch. I've got a good one here today. I got Catherine Switzer. She's tough as nails. She's in New Zealand right now, but you were the first woman to run the Boston Marathon back in the 1960s. Is that right? No, let's get it right, Joe. I was the first woman to officially register and run the Boston Marathon. In 66, Roberta Gibbs jumped out of the bushes and ran the race. And in 67, I wanted to run and my coach insisted that I sign up for the race. And there were no rules, by the way, about it being a men's only race. Uh, we, we looked at all the rules, we checked the entry form, and I registered. And that's what made such a controversy because you know the story. The official attacked me in the race because I was a woman. So we'll tell that story. Did you, did you suspect when you were... When you were signing up, did you suspect there was going to be a problem? Or did, like, what did it feel? I can't even imagine, right? Because I, I run my life like I could just do anything. And so I'm, I'm listening to you thinking, you weren't allowed. How does that feel? Well, first of all, I've always, I had always run with men because there were no women running that I knew of. And I was always welcome. And I felt this is a really amazing community. These are the original sensitive new age guys. You have to imagine, again, that this is the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. It's the eve of the women's liberation movement. And I always thought when I started running with these guys, they would think, you know, I'm there to be in their face. And in fact, they were just totally welcoming and very, very helpful. This is at Syracuse University where I was a student. I ran on the, with, not on, but with the men's cross country team. And, um, and that's where I met my coach, Arnie Briggs, who was an ex-marathoner, and he was a volunteer coach, and he helped train me. But um, they, they, <clears throat> these guys were so welcoming that I knew when I got to Boston, I would be welcomed by the, the runners, and in, indeed I was. <clears throat> they, were, they were fantastic, um, and it wasn't until in the race that this controversy happened with the official. And, and um, when you filled out the form... I did a little research. When you filled out the form, you didn't put your full name, so you suspected something might happen. You know, no. <laughs> it's a series of coincidences you could not possibly have repeated. I started writing journalism when I was about 13 for my high school newspaper, and they, the typesetter kept misspelling my name, Catherine, because my dad misspelled my name on my birth certificate. He left the E out of the Catherine in the middle, and so they kept trying to correct it. And indeed, that happened through all my report cards, all my awards, everything. So I got really tired of it, and I started signing my name, K.V. Switzer. And of course, since I wanted to be a sports journalist, you know, I thought that was a cool thing to do. I was going to be like J.D. Salinger or T.S. Eliot, and I was going to sign my name, K.V. Switzer. So by the time I got to university, it was K.V. Switzer, and that's how I signed the entry form. So that series, of co that was a coincidence th that it was there. I was not trying to defraud them. Um, on the other hand, Joe, I got to tell you, I was not going to go to Boston and say, hi, hi, I'm here. I'm a girl, you know. Uh, <laughs> I was there to run. I was an athlete. I, you know, had my head down, was concentrating on the race, wanted, just wanted to run it. Why was society, like, why did society reject it? Like, 
I, I think a lot about um, what we're going through today and how we're not always right as a collective, right? You know, we, we used to recommend, you remember this, nine out of 10 doctors recommend smoking Marlboro cigarettes. They were recommending rather than breastfeeding, they had powdered milk was the, the more humane way to feed children. Like there's been so many ridiculous instances of things the, the collective recommends individuals do. Well, like why did they, why couldn't women run? What was that all about? Well, no, there was just, the whole theory was that women were an inferior species, that we were weak and fragile and that our job was to have babies and that um, the, and be good mothers. And the, the problem was that if we did something arduous like a marathon or ran and sweat, uh, which was unfeminine, you know, our job was to be feminine and attractive. Um, it was unseemly and dangerous because, you know, we would probably lose our reproductive capability. And, and of course, that, that's a myth that still persists hugely, hugely in the Mideast and in Southern Europe and South America. Um, and we're, we're still trying to overcome that. Of course, the opposite is the case, is that women actually have more endurance and, and stamina than men. And we're seeing that play out now in long distance races. And also the fact that, you know, the health benefits from running have been phenomenal. And women are, in fact, are driving now the, the attendance numbers of all of our races. We've, we've watched that grow. It's been a social, it's been a social revolution, nothing short of it. But anyway, that was the theory then. And, and hey, look, let's give the guys credit here. Um, you know, after World War I, especially, when the, the, the whole male population of the world was decimated, everybody want, was rushing to make sure that we repopulated. And, and, you know, women didn't have time to be athletes and didn't want to be athletes because they had bigger jobs to do. So um, it's only been really in the last 50 years, 50, 60 years, that women have been allowed to emerge. The future is going to be really, really exciting. <laughs> amazing. It, it, it is amazing to... to to think back, my mother would run in the 70s, so you probably inspired her. She would run 10 miles a day. Um, you probably got her going. I probably knew her. There were so few women in the 70s who ran 10 miles a day. What was her name? Jean DeSena. Uh, my parents got divorced. It became Jean De Palma, but she was in Queens, New York, so she wasn't in Boston. I was, I was living in New York. I was, you know, I just went to Boston. Yeah, you went to Boston, right. But yeah, you wouldn't have known her. And she got into yoga and meditation. She went into a health food store in Queens and somehow met a yogi. And the yogi turned her on to all this crazy stuff. One of the things the yogi turned her on to, you might know this, in Queens, there's a 3,100-mile run around a one-mile loop called the Transcendence Run. Of course, I was there. I got lifted by, you know, whatever his name was, the, 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 the uh, yogi. Yogi, yeah, yeah. But he's a very famous guy and he's done wonderful things. In fact, um, I think Rainbow Bridge in, um, up in Niagara Falls is dedicated to him. Wow. Shri Chimoy, yes. Carl Lewis and I got honored by him. We came into this stadium and he, he lifted us, you know, it was this real procedure. And while we were there, the, the, this, this event was going on and they kept running around the same block. I've got to say they looked quite zoned out, but <laughs> it was amazing. Amazing, right? So, yeah, so she stumbled upon all that. And and then I guess through the years, it just permeated in my brain that there's something special about pushing yourself, you know, not, not to a point where you hurt yourself, but to a point where, you know, you go outside your comfort zone. And, um, and that's how Spartan was born. But you, for all I know, you're the reason Spartan exists. Maybe I inspired your mom and your mom inspired you. And that's the whole purpose of what we do, really, is, is if we can pass on a little inspiration to other people or give them a sense of worth or um, that they can do much more than they ever believed. You know, that's what it's all about. I mean, even now, you know, I'm 75 and, and you know, the, the job is still enormous. We're, we're trying to get women around the world just to take that first step to put one foot in front of the other. And um, I created... Um, from my old bib number, this that that the official tried to rip off of me. You see the rip there. He got that. That one is from my back. We've created a, a nonprofit called Two Six One Fearless, and and that's exactly what we're doing. Is we're setting up community clubs all over the world just to get women to take the first step because they're so afraid of of going outside of their comfort zone and they're afraid of looking silly and they're afraid of you know being fat or there's something you know. And once they take that first step, they become like your mom. They feel like they can do anything. So 
and it, and this is not unique to it's, it's not unique to women. It's everybody is trans transported, transformed, and transported by running, um, and that's why it is so popular. But for women, it is phenomenal because it's new. You know, we haven't had that experience. You've had it for thousands of years. We haven't had it. I um I got an email today. You ready? Yeah, sure. This is from um. This is from a woman who did a Spartan race, Candace. Six years ago this month, I set a date on the calendar to take my own life. A few months later, I ran my first Spartan race. This month, this week, this day, I launched a business inspired by my travels to do these Spartan events. I didn't finish the business plan. I'm creating it on the go. I'm terrified, but here it goes. So, so it really does. Um, it doesn't have to be a Spartan race, right? It doesn't have to be the Boston Marathon. But like you said, taking that first step, being a little fearless, right? Getting outside your car. It's really magic. Yeah, it is magic. But, but almost all of us need somebody to give us the opportunity to take the first step. So you creating the events and they looking at the people and saying, hey, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Or maybe I can do that too. And for us, just taking a woman by the hand and saying, hey, come out and walk and run with me. We're going to give you a safe community, a safe space to do this in. And we followed up with also an educational program with 261 Fearless. I'd love everybody to go online and take a look at our program and join us. But but it's true. You know, those women, uh, you, you say, you know, most of the women in the world do not live in a fearful situation, but most of the women in the world do live in a fearful situation. And uh, it, it's not just women in North Africa or Saudi who are under a burqa. It could be the woman who lives next door to you, um, as, as, as this woman has written to you. And um, just if she had a friend, and she did, fortunately, and she took that step, that's, that's all the difference. That's absolutely amazing. And you can bet her kids aren't going to be the same. <laughs> no, no, it really is. Um, why, how did we end up here? Like, why, why, um, why are we so fearful of, of, of doing I, I know. I know what you're saying. There's some governments that just, you know, or societies that just don't allow it. But what's going on that that uh, we're not able to reach our full potential? Oh, well, it's profound ignorance, actually. I mean, opportunity is everything. Uh, I was really, really lucky when I was that 12 year old girl. You know, I remember coming home from elementary school and saying to my dad, when I went to high school, I was going to be a cheerleader. You know, I was going to be pretty and popular and date the captain of the football team. And he said, you don't want to cheer for other people. You want people to cheer for you. So why don't you get out and run a mile a day and make the field hockey team in your high school? Uh, duh. It never even occurred to me, you know. And actually, that mile a day was transforming. And, um, and it gave me the courage to take two miles and then three and then five. And then I met Arnie and then it was the 10K and a marathon. So uh, we just need the experience and the opportunity. Also, if you are raised in profound ignorance, um, it, it, you, you only have the, the, most of us only have the capacity to think of what we know. And we really, really need to expand that. And again, it, that's one of our big jobs in life is to, you know, influence at least a few people in your life to get them to take that step and, and show them how, give them the opportunity. Ta- talent is everywhere. <laughs> that's my my fear. talent is absolutely everywhere just give them the opportunity yeah just the opportunity we need but a lot of times uh we don't know we have the opportunity i mean you made your own opportunity no my opportunity came from my father we'll be right back to this interview but first a quick word from today's sponsor Superbeats heart chews as we age fatigue and lack of endurance it's not something we can fix with more and more caffeine here's a new way to start your day Superbeats heart chews they're a tasty treat they give you the energy you need and they're good for you no more afternoon coffee or energy drinks and don't fall for the idea that candy would be a quick pick-me-up add two delicious plant-based Superbeats heart chews to your morning routine and you'll be promoting heart healthy energy for your day no caffeine crash because Superbeats heart chews unique clinically researched grapeseed extract promotes heart healthy energy and normal blood pressure as part of a healthy lifestyle in fact the grapeseed extract used in Superbeats heart chews has been clinically shown to be two times as effective at supporting normal blood pressure as a healthy lifestyle alone so do more for your heart and treat yourself with Super Beats Heart Chews. Get free shipping and returns, a 90-day money-back guarantee. And right now, for Spartan Up listeners, you can get a free 30-day supply with your first purchase at superbeats.com slash Spartan. 
That's superbeats.com slash Spartan. But a lot of times uh, we don't know we have the opportunity. I mean, you made your own opportunity. No, my opportunity came from my father. He told me I could run this mile. I thought I, I remember whining to him and saying, I couldn't possibly run a mile. It's like climbing Kilimanjaro, Dad. I couldn't possibly do that. And he said, sure you can. And he went out and we, we measured the yard together. And he said, seven laps. <laughs> we had a big yard. And I went out and he said, you could do it right now. And then he said another thing. He said, it wasn't, it wasn't about doing it fast. It was just about finishing the job. And, and, and I often say destiny is about finishing the job. You know, Just keep doing it. So you do need somebody to influence you and inspire you. And in fact, though, for instance, uh, the big city marathons have transformed the face of the world, in my view, okay? And my husband's, Roger Robinson. We've written um, a couple of books about these things, and um, he's written many books. But one of them, 26.2 Marathon Stories, we say that the, ma- the big city marathons have transformed the face of the world because we, we see now all over the world a, a peaceful, inclusive, um, egalitarian society at work <laughs> that like at almost in no other place can we see this. And I've seen in New York, because that's where I'm from, um, millions of people cheering thousands of other people. And there are people on the sidelines who are crippled and they are um, obese and they're but they're watching these people, and then they I hear them, they turn to somebody else and say, Jesus, she can do that, I can do that. And that's how they sometimes start. They just need the inspiration to see it's possible. Because in the New York City Marathon, the competitors are everything. People without arms and legs, they're blind, they're in wheelchairs, they are super fast, gorgeous Ethiopians and Kenyans and Americans, and um, they, they are um, everything on the spectrum. And it is one of the most enlightening uh, events, the marathon in our cities, one of the most enlightening and educational events ever. My, my uh, eight-year-old son, we were in Boston. He's 16 now, so eight years ago, we were in Boston. We went to a Nike store. It was the year after the Boston bombing. And in the store, people were running on the treadmill to donate money. So depending on how far you ran, Nike would donate money. So my son got on, he ran a little bit. He listened to a speech from one of the women that were uh, affected by the previous year's Boston bombing. He got inspired. He said, I, I want to run the marathon tomorrow. And I said, well, you know, you're eight, you're eight years old. You don't even know what a marathon is. Why don't we go for a four-mile run right now and see how you do? So we went on a little four-mile run. And, of course, you know, he was like, oh, I'm tired. But he still wanted to do it. And so we, um, we did it. We went out on the Boston Marathon. He was eight years old eight years ago. And we started after the start line because we couldn't be official. And we made a cool shirt with his name on it and everything. And we went slow and we walked a lot and and we got through it and um, changed his life. I know. Absolutely. Silly to say at eight years old, but game changer. You know, that is a phenomenal story that the kid made up his mind he was going to do it. And I don't know how much whining and crying he did, but I I bet not a lot. And... um, and he did it. He'll never forget that, ever. That's going to change his whole life. Amazing. The story gets better. Years later, the photography company that takes the photos for the marathon happened to come and pitch some business for Spartan. And I said, oh, I got a crazy story. And they found the photo. They would, too. Yeah. That's- <laughs> and- <laughs> They're amazing. <laughs> and so we got, we got a photo, which is, which is kind of cool. So I agree with you. Um, about them being incredibly powerful. Obviously, I'm in the business, but also in bringing people. Like I always feel like, I always feel like if we went to North Korea and we set up a marathon or a Spartan race, and we got some Americans and South Koreans and Chinese and you name it, all to do it together, we would solve the political issue in like seven seconds. Right. Totally agree. Yeah. And 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 also the male female issue. Yeah. You know, I've been working with um, uh, something called the Secret Marathon, uh, which was created mostly by Martin Parnell and and, uh, uh, Kate McKenzie in BC. BC. If you you haven't talked to them, you really should talk to them. And they created and ran in um, the first marathon for women in Afghanistan. 
And it was called the Secret Marathon because these women were had to run under cover of darkness and total secrecy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But those women and then the men who helped them and then running together, they 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 completely broke down thousands and thousands of years of um of of sexual um division. And I mean that's huge because these it's so strong in Afghanistan. I mean, that the, the woman out on the street, if she were running, it gets stoned. I mean, it's, it's, it is phenomenal to then break through somebody's thought processes just through running like that. But it is very, very powerful. I agree. I agree. It's going to be difficult to do that right now in Afghanistan, though. We, we, <laughs> I'd love to see you try. <laughs> we, we put on, um, believe it or not, I don't know, five, six years ago, but we, we weren't allowed to get any press for it. We put on an all-female Spartan race in Saudi Arabia. Oh, God, really? That's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, we couldn't get press, but we had a couple of thousand females out there, and, and that was amazing. And, you know, I've been to races in the Middle East where we've had Spartan races, and, and it's, you know, 100 degrees Fahrenheit out, and women are in burkas out there, in black, and it's hot, and um, they're getting it done. And so I, I look at them and I say, there's an age old Spartan saying from 2,500 years ago, right? The only reason Spartan men exist is because Spartan women give birth to them. So like without the women, yeah. no men. That's right. Well, hopefully it'll change. And I think running is, is uh, uh, just been a huge, huge game changer. So we're on the same track on that one. Good for you. Good for you to go, the, go to Saudi. I'd like to hear more about that. And, and um, tell people what they should do, one thing they should do every day. One thing they should do every day is tell their own kids or a kid on the street or a kid anywhere, at a boy, at a girl, you can do anything. Just give them the affirmation that they can do something. Change their life. If they can grow up empowered, they'll be empowered forever. I love it. You're awesome. I'm so glad we met. So how do people find out about you? Where did look you up? Okay, they can go to 261fearless.org, um, find out about our community. Uh, you can ask about me. I think there's a way of contacting me there. Also, my website is um, marathonwoman.com. That's the title of my book, which is hopefully going to be soon a film. Uh, kind of exciting. If that happens, I'll talk to you again about it. And um, so marathonwoman.com, 261fearless.org, O-R-G. So that's how to reach me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Spartan Up. Do you want to be ready for anything? Download Joe's free ebook at spartan.com slash ready for anything. Do you know someone who needs a little help staying motivated, staying informed, getting or staying mentally and physically resilient? We're here three days every week with a mix of content to help you stay strong from mindset to nutrition and everything in between. Listen every Tuesday to hear Joe DeSena, Spartan Race founder and CEO, and the rest of the week, join us for DECA, Endurance, and Classic episodes. See you next time. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Superbeats Heart Chews. Right now, you can get a free 30-day supply with your first purchase at superbeats.com slash spartan.